What is up, guys? Welcome to the Red Chip Poker Podcast. This is Coach Weasel, and the title of this episode is The Science of Shot Taking. One of the things that's been a rite of passage for poker players for a very long period of time is to take all of their data and put it into a risk of ruin calculator. A risk of ruin calculator takes certain parameters such as our expected win rate, our standard deviation. This can be found in our poker tracker of choice and is measured in BB per hundred and the number of buy-ins in our bankroll. We input that information and the output is a percentage, which is our risk of ruin. The idea behind that value is it's our chance of going broke given the number of buy-ins in our bankroll, given our current win rate, and given the standard deviation of our strategy, which basically measures how swingy our strategy is. So it shouldn't really be a big surprise that if we have a very high variance strategy, we do lots of three betting and over betting, we're going to have a higher standard deviation than another player who has a lower variance strategy. They don't do as much three betting, for example, they play a tighter range of hands pre-flop. So the higher our standard deviation, the more swingy our game, the bigger the chances we go on a very big downswing. Also, the bigger the chances we go on a very big upswing as well. But the ultimate end result is that we're more likely to go broke if we have a higher standard deviation. Now, what's acceptable for a risk of ruin percentage? Generally, it's considered less than 1% is good for a professional poker player whom all of their income comes through poker. Whereas if we're a recreational player, 5% or less is considered acceptable as a rough guide. Now I'd like to give you some rough numbers. We're then going to discuss why these numbers are often misinterpreted and why the average player does not use a risk of ruin calculator in a relevant way. In some places, it's possible to do the reverse, to specify in a certain calculator what type of risk of ruin is acceptable. Then the calculator will tell us how many buy-ins we need in our bankroll. So to give an example, if we imagine that we have a win rate of four big blinds per 100 hands, and we say that we're a professional player and we want a risk of ruin less than 1%, well, what is the recommendation from said calculator? It's that we need 37 buy-ins in our bankroll. Okay, sounds fine. How does that change if we are a recreational player and it's less of a big deal if we go broke, we can easily top up our bankroll. We have other sources of income aside from poker. And we say that 5% risk of ruin or less is acceptable. Well, according to the calculator, now it's okay to only have 24 buy-ins in our bankroll. It's still fairly unlikely that we'll go broke, but we could conceivably, even with a four big blind per hundred win rate, go on a really bad run and drop all of those 24 buy-ins. Now using that information, let's think about the answer to the following question. Let's pretend that we are an NL100 online player and we want a 1% risk of ruin or less. How many dollars do we need in our bankroll to comfortably play an L100? Now, if you answered $3,700, that's very logical. And it's actually the answer that most players would give, but it's not a very good or relevant answer in this case. Let's see why not. Let's just imagine for a minute that we played an L100 with only 12 buy-ins in our bankroll. So 1200 bucks. Now that might sound kind of crazy at first, but there's an important detail that we need to keep in mind. And that is if we lose a chunk of our bankroll, we're going to be moving down limits to NL50. And if we run bad at NL50, we're going to be moving down to NL25. Let's say that we'll move down to the previous limit. Anytime we only have 10 buy-ins left in our roll for the current limit. So as an example, we shoot NL100 with 1200 bucks in our roll, but when we drop to 1000 bucks in our bankroll, which is 10 binds for NL100, we move down to NL50. So now we actually have 20 binds in our bankroll at NL50. And let's just say we keep on playing NL50 until we only have $500 in our roll. So that's actually another 10 binds at NL50. And now we're at 25 NL with 500 bucks in our roll. That's another 20 buy-ins at 25 and L. But we'll only use 10 of those because when we get to 250 bucks, we're actually going to move down to NL10. NL10, we can lose 15 buy-ins there before we move down again. NL5, 
We can lose 10 buy-ins before we move down at 50 bucks left in our bankroll. And then we're left at the lowest available limit online, which is 2NL. We have 50 bucks in our roll, which is 25 buy-ins at NL2. That initial bankroll management that seemed really light, where we only had 12 buy-ins in our bankroll, if we're able to aggressively move down anytime we incur losses, we're actually playing really well rolled. If anything, we're actually overrolled, as ironic as that seems, playing NL100 with 1200 in our roll, because that's 72 buy-in bankroll management. Working with these numbers, we could technically shoot NL100 even more aggressively with less dollars in our bankroll. And this really circles back to how players typically misuse the risk of ruin calculator. So for example, when the calculator asks for how many buy-ins do you have in your bankroll? Well, if they're playing NL100 with $1,200 roll, they input 12 buy-ins into the risk of ruin calculator. And of course, the calculator is going to tell them that their risk of ruin is extremely high and they should be playing NL100 with more buy-ins than they have currently, perhaps 37 buy-ins. So the misinterpretation there is that players believe that they need 3,700 in their role to play NL100. Now that might be true if it's the lowest limit available. So let's say, for example, the lowest game in your casino is NL100 or NL200, and you don't have the option to play lower limits. In that case, it might make sense to have a base level of 30 buy-ins or more. That way your risk of ruin is going to be extremely low. But so long as we have the ability to move down limits when incurring losses, we do not need that full amount of 37 or 24 buy-ins in our bankroll to play that next limit up. Thinking about online, the average types of bankroll management strategy players use is they'll often have something like 25 buy-ins for the lower limits. Then as they move up, they'll increase the amount of buy-ins they have in their roll. So they'll maybe say things like, okay, at 25 and L, I'm okay with just having 25 binds in my roll. But at 50 and L, which is a bit tougher, it's a bit swingier, I'm going to need 30 binds in my roll. And at NL100, I'm going to need 35. And by the time I get to NL2K, I'm going to need 50 binds in my roll, or I'm going to need 100 binds in my roll. So as we can see, the player is increasing their bankroll requirement without taking into account the fact that their bankroll is naturally increasing in terms of number of binds when we factor in that we have more buy-ins after we move down. The reason why this is super important is because there is a huge opportunity cost for players who don't realize that they could be shooting more aggressively than they do currently. Let's say, for example, we shoot each new limit at 12 buy-ins in our bankroll and take a two buy-in shot. In order to get from NL2 online, the lowest limit available, to NL2K, that whole path is less than 200 buy-ins. Now that might be a fairly optimistic estimate because it assumes that we don't sometimes lose chips at the higher limit and then have to make it back at the lower limit, and that's going to happen. But assuming we have a smooth path from NL2 to NL2K, where we don't have to move down limits, it's less than 200 buy-ins. Something like 175 buy-ins. It depends on the stakes available at your network. Now, if we compare to someone who is taking shots at the next limit only when they have 30 buy-ins or maybe 40 buy-ins, we're talking about a path of potentially 500 buy-ins or more from the lowest limit to NL2K online. In other words, this one piece of advice of shooting sooner can potentially half the number of buy-ins you need to make in order to make it from the lowest limits online to some of the highest limits online. To give you a really extreme example, imagine someone starting at the lowest limits sets themselves the challenge of making 100 buy-ins at every limit. Well, after they've made 200 buy-ins, they'll be moving up to NL10, whereas the player who follows the very aggressive bankroll management strategy we're considering right now would already be at NL2K. Now, that is an oversimplification because obviously as we move up to the tougher games, our win rate might start to decrease. So it's obviously going to take longer to make those 200 buy-ins. But what would you rather be? The guy who makes 200 stacks and is now at NL10 or the guy who makes 200 stacks and is now playing NL2K online? The same principles apply for live play, by the way. The lowest limit that you can play at your local casino 
you may need to make sure that you're reasonably well rolled for that, probably 25 buy-ins or more. But as you move up limits, you can shoot very aggressively because you have that cushion of being able to move back down limits. And shooting aggressively at the next limit can be the difference between making it to the highest limits or just making it to the next limit up. Now let's think about the specific aspect of taking shots. The first recommendation here I'm going to give is to take a two bind shot at the next limit when you decide to take a shot. And this is contrary to what many players do, which is they maybe save up 10 buy-ins, 15 buy-ins, or even 20 buy-ins for shooting the next limit. Now there's a couple of problems with larger shots. The first problem is we now have to spend much longer at the previous limit grinding it out so that we have enough dollars in our bankroll to take that very large 20 or 10 buy-in shot. So there's an opportunity cost there. We're playing longer at the lower limit than we need to. The other problem with that is that even though large shots are more likely to go through, they are still going to fail some of the time and losing 20 buy-ins at the next limit up is psychologically demoralizing. Losing two buy-ins is bad enough. We don't especially enjoy that, but it's something that we can take in our stride and recover from fairly quickly. Recovering from a 20 buy-in downswing at the next limit where the stacks are probably twice what we're used to playing for anyway is going to take much longer and in some cases psychologically that could be enough to put a player out of the game if they lose that much at the next limit. So we can see the risk to reward ratio is really not there. The reward is we might be able to move up limits but the risk is that we might find ourselves actually quitting poker because we can't deal with the fact that we lost so many buy-ins at the next limit up. Just to think of this in a slightly different way, just in case you don't get it so far. Imagine that I'm thinking about shooting NL100 and at NL50 I grind up a 20 buy-in shot at NL100. Then I sit down with my 20 buy-ins at NL100 to take the shot. In fact, my 20 buy-in shot, so I presumably have more than 20 buy-ins at NL100 in my bankroll. I've got a 20 buy-in shot of 2k. Now I'm sitting down with my first buy-in and it just so happens I run good. And I never look back. I just spin straight up. I only actually used one of my designated 20 buy-ins in the shot. So here's the next question. Of what value to me were those additional 19 stacks for NL100? Didn't even use them. Would have been much better if I'd just taken a one buy-in shot and gone straight up. Now, of course, a one or two buy-in shot's more likely to fail, but I can quickly rebuild that. And ultimately, it's still going to be more efficient, even if I end up going through six or seven buy-ins before I finally spin up at NL100. Using seven buy-ins is more efficient than grinding the full 20, 13 of which I never use. Hopefully, you can see the goal here is to be as efficient as possible and to reduce the number of stacks we need to win in order to make it from low limits to high limits. So let's assume we're taking our small two buy-in shot. Let's think about the psychology of taking a shot. Now the big problem many players have here is they have a do or die approach and that's mirrored by the fact that they might be shooting 20 buy-ins. So the mentality is I'm either gonna make it and it's gonna be great or I'm gonna crash and burn. My recommended approach in terms of goal for the first time you shoot a limit, is simply to survive. Just see if you can play 10K hands with your shot without going broke and having to move down. We shouldn't really ever expect to be profitable in the first 10k hands of a new limit. Sometimes we might be, which is great, but let's not expect it. Let's just see if we can survive. And obviously for a live player, 10k hands might sound like a lot. It's probably more like 1k if you're playing live. It's about the same amount of time investment. So see if you can play 1k hands without losing your shot. Now that might feel like it's going to involve playing in a way that's suboptimal, a bit tighter than we should really be playing. But there are some big advantages to that. The first is that it allows us to get used to the bigger stack sizes. And whether players admit it or not, this is actually one of the bigger problems that players face when they move up. They're sitting there at the table with twice as much cash as they usually have. And even if they don't realize it, it's affecting them subconsciously. The types of decisions they're going to make with that larger stack are not necessarily going to mirror their standard A game way of playing poker with their regular stack size. And the only workaround here is to just simply get used to playing with a bigger stack size. We want the stack size in front of us to start feeling like one stack rather than 2x our previous limit. 
Surviving a bit longer as we take our shot also gives us a chance to scout the environment. We get more time to see what types of players are playing at that limit. In the context of online play, we might use that time to get some color tags on our opponents or build up stats for our HUD. In the case of live play, it might just be figuring out who the regs are, whether pre-flop sizings are the same as they are at the previous limit, what the game flow feels like. This is going to give us time to settle down psychologically and we're going to see our A game start to appear at some point. If there's any type of imposter syndrome, it's going to disappear. So rather than thinking, okay, I'm an NL100 reg playing NL200, there's a switch where our brain starts to tell us, okay, you've been here for a while. You're actually an NL200 reg now. You're not an imposter. You belong here. You've survived. And it's that relaxation of our psychological state that's going to allow our A game to appear more consistently at the next limit up. It's at that point we can start to expect that our shot is much more likely to go through. One of the reasons this is so important is until that relaxation occurs, players often have misconstrued ideas about what's happening at the next limit above them. And the best example, we see this crop up time and time again. You'll have seen it on the Red Chip Poker Discord. We'll have a player who's playing NL2 and his win rate's really good. He's winning at 10 big blinds per 100 hands, for example. And then every time he moves up to NL5, he just gets completely crushed. Minus 10 big blinds per 100 hands. And in his mind, it's because at the next limit up at L5, everyone's way more aggressive. There's all this three betting going on. Everyone's shoving all in pre-flop. People are just raising flops a lot. So what does that player do? He tries to adjust to that. He doesn't really realize it. It's on a subconscious level, but he's playing in a completely different way at NL5 than he is at NL2. That's because he thinks that the players at NL5 are very different. So he's playing differently in response. It's actually that change in play style for our hero that's causing him to be a losing player at the next limit up, which in most cases is going to be pretty much the same as the limit that you've just moved from. There's this misconception in poker that the next limit up is twice as hard. So if you're moving from NL100 to NL200, it's twice as hard. I don't actually think the difference between the lowest limits online and the highest limits online are necessarily twice as hard. Admittedly a lot harder, but not necessarily twice as hard. It could be 180% as hard, for example. But the gaps between individual limits, we're not talking about a big gap. If anything, NL5 might be 5% harder than NL2, for example. The problem occurs when we're not relaxed psychologically and we think that we have to make some drastic shift to our game because now we've moved up to the next limit where all of the big boys play. Now let's finish with some cautionary advice before you go away and blow through your entire bankroll with this new aggressive bankroll management strategy. Keep in mind that the more aggressive our bankroll management strategy, the more discipline is going to be required. So the shallower we are, the more important it is to be able and disciplined in moving down when it's required. We also need to be more aware of the potential loss at any given moment. Now, I mean something very specific by that. Let's just say, for example, that you are shooting the next limit up at 11 buy-ins and you're taking a one buy-in shot. So let's say I'm shooting NL100 with 1100 bucks in my roll. And the plan is to move down after I lose a stack. Well, let's assume that I start playing with my 1100 roll at NL100 and the beginning of the session doesn't go great. I'm down, let's say 70 bucks, but I haven't quite lost a buy-in, so I keep on playing. Next hand, we get dealt pocket aces. Obviously we have to get the stacks in for 100 big blinds. Unfortunately, our opponent sucks out with his pocket jacks and now we've lost a stack. So what is our total loss there? Well, it's more than a buy-in because we were already down 70 and we've just lost another 100. So our plan was to take a one buy-in shot and we've just lost 1.7 buy-ins. That's because we weren't projecting forward to the potential loss at any given moment. So the simple way of saying this is that if you are taking a one buy-in shot, it's really a two buy-in shot. 
So the way that it would work is you would have 1200 in your roll in that scenario. And if we were down more than one buy-in at any single point in the session, we would end our shot at that point. So that is actually a one buy-in shot. Could be up to two buy-ins lost. So we need to keep that in mind when we work on our bankroll management strategy. Now the information we've just discussed, many players are not aware of it and they are stuck grinding long hours, earning more and more buy-ins at a limit when they could already be moving up. So the information has been given to you, make sure you use it to the best of your ability. This can honestly be the difference between you being reasonably good, making it reasonably far in poker, compared to making it all the way to the limit that you want to be playing ideally. Thanks very much for your attention, guys. This was Coach Weasel, and this was the Red Chip Poker Podcast.